On the 3rd of September 1658, Oliver Cromwell, the Lord Protector and ruler of the English Commonwealth, and the man responsible for the parliamentarian victory in the English Civil War and the execution of King Charles I died. But this would not be the end of his story, as for centuries part of him would remain unburied and pass through many different hands. However, Cromwell's remains would be posthumously dug up and then executed in front of a huge crowd. It was a shocking end to a man who was regarded as a hero by some, but by others a brutal tyrant who would cause chaos and slaughter in lands such as Ireland. Cromwell rose from humble beginnings to become the most important man in England and a genius on the battlefield. However, King Charles II, after the monarchy was restored, would go on the offensive and he wanted to publicly shame and punish those men who were responsible for his father's execution. He targeted those who signed Charles I's death warrant and the name at the top of the list of those to be punished was Cromwell, and despite his death, there would be no mercy shown. Join us today as we look at opening the coffin of Oliver Cromwell, and as always, to support our channel, please make sure to subscribe. Oliver Cromwell is most famously known for being one of the generals on the side of Parliament during the English Civil War against King Charles I, and he restructured Parliament's forces to create the new model army. These were heavily religious soldiers, who were formidable and very feared, and his actions in defeating the king led to the overthrow of the Stuart monarchy. He would oversee a huge number of changes across England, would oversee the conversion of the system of ruling from a monarchy to a republic, and the House of Lords was also abolished. But Cromwell was a leading force behind the execution of King Charles I. He wanted the king to be put to death and dealt with once and for all, and he pushed for this in secret, when people were more than happy to have him exiled. Cromwell believed Charles was a tyrant, and a man who had betrayed and punished his own people, and he believed Charles's actions were responsible for the deaths of around what was 7% of the population, who died in the English Civil War. For this the king was placed on trial, and Charles himself did not recognise the legality of the courtroom and the trial, and he believed he had been sent by God to rule, and that he possessed a divine right of kings. Charles claimed that, no learned lawyer will affirm that an impeachment can lie against the king. One of their maxims is that the king can do no wrong. I would know by what power I am called hither. I would know by what authority I mean lawful authority. He refused to plead his guilt or innocence, but he would later be removed from the courtroom, and the king was declared guilty at a public session on the 27th of January 1649. The death sentence read that, that the court being satisfied that he, Charles Stuart, was guilty of the crimes of which he has been accused, did judge him tyrant, traitor, murderer and public enemy to the good people of this nation, to be put to death by the severing of his head from his body. Cromwell had got what he wanted, and as mentioned he was one of the most senior figures who signed the death warrant of the king. Three days later King Charles I was led out to an execution scaffold in front of thousands at the banqueting house of the Palace of Whitehall, and Cromwell had got his wish, as a swift execution, occurred three days after the king was condemned. But following the execution, a republic known as the Commonwealth of England was declared. Cromwell was offered the chance to become king, and he did debate this, but he took the position as the Lord Protector, and he liked to see himself as a watchman over the people of England, rather than a ruler. In the years later he imposed strict Puritan rules on the people of England, and he rampaged and caused a huge amount of slaughter in Ireland. Cromwell's rules led to him not being considered too popular, However, in 1658, he was stricken by a severe bout of malarial fever. He may have rejected treatment due to his religious beliefs, and he also began to complain of problems with his kidneys and passing water. But Cromwell was informed in August 1658 about his daughter passing away, and this may have also hastened his death as he was grief-stricken. On the 3rd of September 1658, on the anniversary of his victories at the Battle of Dunbar and Worcester, Oliver Cromwell died at Whitehall. That evening a huge storm swept across England and Europe, and people believe this was a sign from God, but many historians have believed that he died from what was blood poisoning. But what is captivating is what happened in the days after his death, as he would be buried in a huge funeral, which was actually based on that of King James I. With this, Cromwell, despite never being king, was given a king's funeral, one based on the father of his great rival Charles I, and it was as if he was solidifying his place in the history books as a king, and this title he would speak out and take great action against. In death, Cromwell was treated as a monarch, 
as his body was buried inside of Westminster Abbey. However, there was a catch. It's believed that he was actually buried two weeks earlier than his actual funeral service occurred because of the rapid state of decay with Cromwell's remains, and the fact his remains and body were in a bad way, and this led to them being buried actually in secret inside of the Abbey. The funeral would occur on the 23rd of November 1658, but Cromwell's body had been embalmed to keep off decay, but this was not good enough. It was buried it's believed without ceremony, in a vault to the east end of Henry VII's chapel, inside of Westminster Abbey, in the evening of the 10th of November, in secret. A burial taking place without ceremony was what was said to have been in keeping with the religious beliefs of Cromwell. However, the body of Oliver Cromwell did not lie at rest inside of Westminster Abbey for too long. The exact site of his burial was close to where kings and queens had been buried, showing his importance in the story of English history. But when the monarchy was restored and King Charles II came onto the throne, the House of Commons voted on the 4th of December 1660 that the coffins of Oliver Cromwell, Henry Ireton, and the judge at the trial of Charles I, John Bradshaw, should be dug up and disinterred from Westminster Abbey. They were condemned to a posthumous execution for their involvement in Charles I's death, and they were to be hanged, drawn and quartered. The plan for this was that Cromwell should be dug up from his grave, dragged through the streets of London on a sledge and hurdle, hanged by the neck from the gallows, and then cut down, before it would then be disemboweled, beheaded and dismembered, or cut into four pieces. The head of Cromwell was then at the disposal of King Charles II, and he would later order that this should be placed above Westminster Hall. But the time then came to dig up Cromwell's body, and to exhume it from Westminster Abbey. His body was hidden inside the wall of the middle aisle of Henry VII's Lady Chapel, and it took a considerable amount of time and effort to exhume it, as the wooden cloth was difficult to move, but Cromwell's coffin was then opened. The coffin plate fixed to the lid read, Oliver, Protector of the Republics of England, Scotland and Ireland, born 25th of April in the year 1599, inaugurated 16th of December 1653, died 3rd of December in the year 1658, was buried here. At some point the coffin was opened and the remains of Cromwell were taken out of it. On the 28th of January 1661, his body was taken with Ireton's to the Red Line Inn in Holborn, then John Bradshaw's came the next day. It was then taken to Tyburn for its posthumous execution. On the 30th of January 1661, the coffin of Cromwell was cracked open, and it was attached to a sled which was pulled by horses, and the decaying corpse of Cromwell was paraded throughout the streets of London as the public looked on. It arrived at Tyburn, and Cromwell's remains were taken out of the coffin, and from the gallows on the execution scaffold, they were hanged up in chains and were displayed for some hours to the onlookers. The bodies of the others were said to have been in bad ways too, especially Bradshaw's, who had not been embalmed. After being hanged for some time in full view of the public, around 4pm in the afternoon, the body of Cromwell was cut down, and an executioner armed with his axe struck the corpse with eight blows to sever Cromwell's head from his body. Following this, his head was placed on a metal spike on a 20-foot oak pole above Westminster Hall, upon the insistence and orders of King Charles II. There were many theories that the body of Cromwell's that was posthumously executed was not actually his, but historians believe that the head was his, and this has been accepted. But the body of Cromwell was then thrown in a pit at Tyburn, and it's believed this may have been rescued by his daughter, who then interred it separately. The head of Cromwell would pass through many different hands over the next few centuries. Still today, Oliver Cromwell is considered a controversial figure, as some believe he was a brutal dictator, but others believed he liberated England from tyranny. But his actions had a huge impact on England today, and his actions led to changes in government and monarchy that are still felt. But Cromwell's death and subsequent execution shows us the brutality of the times, and also the anger Charles II felt towards those men who had condemned his father, in what was the most shocking execution ever to occur on English soil. Thanks for watching. To support our channel, Please make sure to subscribe and once again, thank you so much for watching.